Welcome to your virtual CFO coach. I'm your host, Leah Torbert, founder and CEO of Harrington Strategic Partners. I've spent my entire career working in the startup world, scaling businesses to multi seven and eight figures. I built this podcast to share all of that knowledge with you and make your path to success shorter and easier. Tune in each week as I cover topics, including financial analysis, cash flow management, holistic strategy, mindset, and more. Now for today's episode. It's the beginning of a new month. In sales, this is an exciting time because you have another chance to meet or even better exceed your monthly goals. In accounting, it's time to buckle down, finish bookkeeping for the prior month, and issue financials. Sounds fun, right? For me, it does because I love to watch the financials transform as all of the month-end tasks are completed and the numbers fall in line. But if you're like many business owners, you don't look forward to this, or you may not even be sure what it is I'm talking about. So what is month-end close? Month-end close is the process of reviewing finalizing and closing the prior month's financial transactions. In essence, it's making sure that the transactions recorded in your accounting system are accurate and complete. Implementing a month-end close process can be helpful for many reasons, including it gives you the opportunity to correct posting errors and omissions. It keeps your receivables and payables up to date. It makes it easier for your CPA to prepare your taxes and cheaper if they have to spend less time on it. It assists in acquiring financing and maintaining compliance, and it also ensures that your books are accurate and organized in case of an audit. You might be asking, okay, this sounds great, but what should be included in the month end close? The point of month end close is to verify that all financial transactions have been entered for the month and the data is correct so financial statements can be issued. With that in mind, it's important to ensure that related transactions are completed in your accounting system prior to month end close. I refer to this as the pre-close checklist. Your list could look something like this. For sales activities, making sure that all of your new customers are entered and customer pricing is also entered in the system if you don't have standardized pricing for everything. This will make sure that accounting can actually get invoices issued and sent out on time. If you maintain inventory, looking at getting your cycle counts done and approved by management and having the inventory adjustments posted in the system before month end for those cycle counts. Your shipping and receiving department, if you have one, making sure that all of your material receipts, so all of the things that have come in for the month for your inventory, that those have been posted in your accounting software, and that any shipments that you have sent out for the month have also been posted. This will also make sure that purchase orders for your vendors and bills can get posted for accounting and the invoices for your customers can get sent out. So we want to make sure that all that information is correct and accurate for accounting. If you produce or manufacture anything, you know, making sure that those production activities are posted. So that's going to relate to your work in process and inventory and things like that. And then on the accounting side, making sure that all expense reports are entered. So that includes expense reports for company cards and personal reimbursements. We want to make sure that all of those expenses get put into the system regardless of how they've gotten paid. All customer invoices are issued. All vendor bills are entered. If you're tracking accounts payable, if not, then it would just be when the bill is actually paid and then all customer and vendor payments are entered. So you want to make sure that all of those things are completed as your pre-close before your month end close process starts. It sounds like a lot of work, but those are just daily activities that happen throughout your business. So try not to let it stress you out too much. You may not get them all done as quickly as you need to, but there's still things that you're doing in your business right now. Once all of the pre-close activities are completed, then the person or people responsible for completing the month end close can begin. This process is typically managed by a member of the accounting staff or an outsourced accounting services company like mine, but it could also be managed by the owners if no one else is in place to assist. 
Typical month-end close activities include bank and credit card account reconciliations, accounts receivable and accounts payable reconciliations, loan reconciliations, and payroll reconciliation. If you have inventory, there could also be a process to tie out the value of the inventory in your accounting system versus the physical counts or cycle counts that have been done throughout the month, if that hasn't been done already. And in case you're not familiar with the term reconciliation, this is the process to verify that the system balances match the documentation that's been provided. That documentation is typically a third party statement, like the ones that come from your bank or your credit card, or other system information like sales orders, purchase orders, could be some shipping or receiving documents that can be used to verify different transactions. And all of that is used to make sure that the reported balances on your financials are correct. So if you've ever balanced your checkbook, you've done a reconciliation. You may not have known that that's what it was called, but that's what you were doing. Once all of the month end close activities are completed, then your financial statements and other reports can be prepared and dispersed to the appropriate people. If your business is required to submit compliance reports to your bank or maybe some other kind of entity, those reports can also be completed and dispersed at this time. You don't want to issue official external financial documents until you're really sure that the information that's provided on those documents is correct. So that's why month end close happens first and then your financials get issued. The tasks included in the pre-close and close process should be limited only to those required to prepare accurate financial statements and compliance reports. This doesn't mean that you can't have other activities that you want completed on a monthly basis. I am sure there are plenty, but those activities should be managed outside of the month end close process. One of the reasons for that is you don't want anything unnecessary holding up your month end close process because month end ensures that your financials are correct. You have accurate data to make business decisions on. You're sharing that data with internal and external people and they are then making additional decisions. So you don't wanna slow that process down. If you have other things outside of that that you want to track or make sure are being done every month, like maybe you have a CRM system and you wanna make sure that all of your business development activities are recorded in there, that can be maintained separate from the month end close process. With that in mind, the next thing is who should be involved in your month end close. And this really depends on the size and complexity of your business. If you're a business of one, you, then you are the one ultimately responsible for completing the month end checklist and preparing your financials unless you outsource some or all of this responsibility. If you have employees and or contractors, then their contribution to the month end close will be based on their roles. As you hire more employees and or contractors that are involved in this process, the best way to keep track of who is responsible for what is to create a RACI matrix. And that's R-A-C-I. RACI stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, and Informed. For each task in your pre-close and close activities, you would identify the person or people that need to be assigned to each category. In some instances, the same person may be listed in multiple boxes. So for example, for the pre-close task of all expense reports need to be entered, the person that is responsible for it could be your accounts payable clerk. The person that is accountable for it could also be your AP clerk. The person that is consulted would be the employees who have to turn their expense reports in and maybe they're managers if you're not getting the response that you need. The informed category could be the managers or it could be you depending on the size of your business and how much you want to know and try to manage on your own every day. And you can easily drop this information into a spreadsheet with names and roles if you'd like to include the roles to view all of the tasks and assignments at a glance just so you have a record somewhere of who's responsible for what. So when should month-end close happen and how long should it take? 
Technically, month end close starts the first day of the next month. Ideally, when month end comes, there will only be a couple of days worth of transactions that need to be entered into the system so the month end close process can begin. But in many businesses, this is far from reality. It's not uncommon for me to meet business owners who have never formally closed the month or the year for that matter. In other cases, some items are reviewed and others are put on the back burner because there's simply not enough time in the day and processes need some work to make it easier to manage. If you're reading all of this and starting to panic, take a deep breath and let it go. Here are some things to keep in mind as you think about how long it should take you to close the month. If this is a completely new process for you, be kind to yourself. Cleaning up past data and getting to a good starting point can take some time. If you have a fairly simple business, your process could be as easy as invoices are issued, payments are posted, bank and credit cards are reconciled, financials are ready to go. And if your business is a little more complicated, it's likely that your month end close process will be longer, especially in the beginning as you're trying to work through all the things that need to be set up to move forward. Some businesses can close the books in five days. Some do it in 30. At the end of the day, it's best to pick a time frame that's doable for your business now and work towards reducing your close time as you implement new processes and assess resource needs. Getting started is more important than stressing your business by trying to do it all at once. So what happens if you don't have a month end close process? Where do you start? This process is going to vary based on your specific circumstances, but I want to go ahead and give you some tips on where to get started. So my first tip for you is to make sure whether you filed your prior year tax return or not. So for example, we're in 2023 as I'm recording this episode. So prior year would be the 2022 fiscal year tax return. It's important because this will determine how far back you can go to start making corrections in your system. If you've already filed a tax return for the prior year, you can't go back in there and make changes. You can't change the data once the tax return is done. That is what has been officially reported to the IRS, and that is what you will be audited on if for some reason you are chosen for an audit. So you want to make sure that your financials match your tax return. For most businesses, that's going to be a fiscal year end of December 31st. But if you have a business that has a different fiscal year end, for example, October 31st or November 30th, then that would be the hard date where you couldn't go back and make any changes prior to that. So if you have issues with your bank account balance or your credit card balance, those issues would have to be corrected in the current year. Now, I want to point out here, because this is very important, if you have identified that you have some data gaps and you're not really sure what kind of impact those data gaps might have on the tax returns you may have just filed, talk to your CPA. You do have the option to amend a tax return, but your CPA is going to be able to give you the best advice on whether it makes sense to do so or not. If you haven't filed your prior year return yet, the next question you should ask your CPA is how long do you have to fix the data in your system to be able to complete that tax return on time? You really need to talk to your CPA about that and make sure you're doing what's best for you and your business. But once you know one way or the other what your start date is, then you know what you can start working on next. So your second step is to take a look at what you're doing now. You may be doing more than you realize. Do you reconcile your bank and credit card accounts now? Or did you in the past, but it just hasn't been consistent? This is important to know. You can check in your system and see when the last date they were reconciled to if you've done one before. If you track accounts receivable, is your accounts receivable up to date? 
Are all your payments matched? Have all your invoices been issued? If there's been any kind of payment discrepancies or balances written off or things like that, discounts that you may have given to your customers, is all that stuff in your system and updated? That way you have accurate balances to move forward. Do you track your vendor bills? So do you have accounts payable in your system or are you just recording the expense when a payment is made? If you have accounts payable, you're actually entering those bills and you're posting payments and you're trying to balance all that so you know exactly how much you owe and when. You wanna make sure that everything matches, right? So if you normally write a check and you paid for something on your credit card, you wanna make sure that the credit card payment has been matched to the bill. It shouldn't really matter how you're paying it, but you wanna make sure it's all matched. And so if you aren't really sure about those balances, the best thing to do is to reach out to the vendor and ask for a statement. And then they can provide a list of the invoices and payments that they've received and you guys can try to match everything up together and see if there's any discrepancies that you need to talk about. Do you have inventory? If so, are you tracking that inventory in your accounting system or is it on a spreadsheet? How are you maintaining what has come in and what has gone out? And do your financials reflect your current inventory value? I worked for a business for a while that managed their inventory using a Google Sheet. They had hired a Excel pro and they had gone in and built these amazing, crazy Excel formulas to keep track of everything. And it worked in the Excel sheet as long as people actually entered the information in. Much like your accounting system, if you're entering the transactions in, in all likelihood, it will be more accurate than if you weren't. And, you know, Excel sheets work the same way. So there's a lot of room for human error. So you want to make sure no matter how you're tracking your inventory, that you know the value of it, you know how much is there. And if it's not inside your accounting system, that you have a way of making sure that the value of your inventory on your balance sheet matches what's actually in stock. Do you have personal expenses recorded as business expenses? This is a big pet peeve of mine. A lot of, especially new business owners do this. They haven't had a chance to get a business credit card or maybe the credit wasn't good enough so no one would give them a business credit card. And so they're using a personal card for business expenses and they don't keep it separate. And so personal expenses get posted accidentally on the PL as business expenses. And so you're taking credit for expenses that don't actually belong to the business. If you are doing this, please stop. Anything that you have that is a personal expense that is posted in your business as a business expense needs to come off your PL right now. In the current year, of course, if it's a closed year, there's nothing you can do about it there. But in the current year, if for some reason, you know, you got a you got a doctor's appointment that you paid for or whatever and it doesn't belong on the business PL, please take it out of there. If you're using that card, you know, and you're reconciling that account, then those expenses should be reclassed to owner's draw. That way they're coming out of equity on your balance sheet and they're not being counted as a business expense. And if you're not sure what any of that means, ask your CPA or you can reach out to me and I'll help you make sure that it's getting posted correctly. The next question is how are you paying yourself? Because this can also be an area of complication for making sure things are recorded correctly. If, if you are an owner and you are being paid through payroll, then those expenses should show up on your P&L under payroll expense, no problem there. If you're taking a cash distribution from the business, that's not payroll. So that should not be included as a payroll expense on your P&L. That's actually an owner draw or a partner distribution, depending on what you call it on your balance sheet. But they get recorded differently. So you want to make sure that you understand the difference because you might be doing both. And so you want to make sure that those transactions are getting recorded correctly. And then think about what other activities that might have a financial impact that you need to review outside of the ones that I've already mentioned here. Every business has some little unique thing that they do 
and it may not seem like it falls into a particular category. So write those down and ask your CPA about them if you're not sure what to do. So the third step is to start cleaning up your data. Before you can fully implement a streamlined month end close process, your data needs to be as accurate as possible. You won't be able to close if your balances are off from prior months. Now that doesn't mean that you have to go back until the beginning of time, because again, if you have a closed tax year, you can't do that. But what you can do is at your starting date, say your tax return was 1231.22. On 1-1-23, you make your adjustments. If you're not sure how to do that, then you can reach out to me and talk to your CPA. There are tons of resources out there, but you make the adjustment on your start date of when you're saying this is going to be good data moving forward. I'm going to reconcile from this date forward and we're going to have as good a data as we can get in here. Reconciling your bank and credit card accounts is top priority. This will ensure that your cash balance is correct, your customer payments are recorded, and expenses are posted to the P&L. Just doing this knocks out a huge chunk of your data. If you can get your cash right, and get all of those expenses that are posting to your bank account and your credit cards into the system recorded under the correct categories, that is a huge step forward to plugging some of these gaps and trusting your data more than you do now. And then you can move on to reconciling other items like loans and inventory if your business has them. Now, if bad or incomplete data is a recurring weak point for your business. I wrote another article with additional information on how to break the cycle of bad debt, and I'll leave a link to that article in the show notes for this so you can go check it out when you have a minute. Step four is to create your RACI matrix and your close timeline. So think about going back to the pre-close and the close items. What items need to be on your checklists? What are the business activities that need to be done before the person or people responsible for month end close and getting your financials issued can actually start that process? It's invoices, shipments, payments, expenses, things like that. What are all of those activities very specific to your business? Don't be general, write them all down line by line what little things need to be done for the pre-close and then your close. Once you have your list of pre-close and close items, the next question is who is responsible for them and when should they be done? And that's when you go back to your RACI, responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. And you look at those four categories for each of your task items and fill in those boxes. And you may get to the end of this and realize I need to put different people in these boxes. Maybe you need to hire a bookkeeper or maybe it's time for you to hire a department manager or something like that. As you're looking at all of this, make notes on where you'd like to go and what you think, you know, what additional resources that you need, because you can build that into your implementation plan and long-term planning for the business and slowly make those adjustments over time. Put all of this stuff into a spreadsheet so you can keep track of it and you can update it as needed as these changes are happening in your business. And then number five, preparing for implementation. Are there written processes for each of the pre-close and close steps? This is huge. As business owners, we make a lot of assumptions. We assume that One, we do all the things that we do consistently. Two, as we're hiring people, when we trained them, that they understood the nuances of everything we needed them to do, and they do it perfectly every time. And three, that if there are changes that need to be made, those changes are going to happen right away, and they're going to be perfect every time. And if you've ever made those assumptions, you know what happens after the fact because something's going to break somewhere. And when you go back and look at the root cause of what it was, someone didn't remember something correctly, or they interpreted something incorrectly. You taught one person and then that person taught someone else. And it's kind of like the telephone game where as more and more people get involved, the story changes. And so having written documented 
procedures for each of these things. That doesn't mean it has to be super long. It could be five sentences if that's all it takes to explain what needs to be done. But as your business grows and as the complexity increases, as you have more functions or processes or people, or you add new product lines or things like that, you want to make sure that all of these things are documented so that everyone that's involved understands what's expected of them. And if you don't have documented procedures and you're not really sure how to do that, I have a checklist that you can download on my website and I will leave a link to that as well. That way you can go get that checklist and start working through your process development. That way you can get ahead of this month end close process. And keep in mind as you're going through this, you're going to document the processes and if it's something they're already doing and the process hasn't really changed, it may not be that hard to get everybody moving in the right direction. But if there's a lot of change, you may need additional training days. You may need some one-on-one -on -one time. So make sure that you're thinking about those things as well from a time management perspective and from a resource load perspective to make sure that you're giving everybody the time that they need and the attention that they need and the feedback as well. Because if they're not doing something correct, they do need to know. They may not be able to, you know, read your mind and that, oh, well, they filled out some form wrong and you got irritated at them and they don't know, so they keep doing it that way. You have to give that feedback as constructively as you can. And then make sure that you have tools in place to assist your team. So if there's additional software or whiteboards or pegboards or something, depending on what it is you're doing in your business, if there's some additional visibility that they need, they can have that as well. In past month end close implementations, Asana and Teams have performed very well as month end close dashboards to keep track of individual tasks, due dates, and accountability. So if you have any questions around that, if you're interested in learning more, just reach out to me and we can talk. Once you get through all of these things, number six, it's the big one, is rolling out month end close. If you have a complicated business, and or you have a lot of people involved in this process, it may be easier to break this down into phases so you don't overwhelm everyone and cause service issues. Because on top of all the things that everybody does every day already, sales, invoicing, shipping, receiving, paperwork, talking to people on the phone, all the things that they have to do every day, you're now asking them to do one more thing or maybe multiple things depending on what their role is. You want to look at the time that's going to be taken to do some of these things as well, because if you try to dump everything on everyone all at one time, they're probably going to get stressed out. They're probably going to be a little irritated because why on earth did we have to do all of these new things now when we've never done them before? The stress and the time could cause issues with getting your orders out and keeping your customers happy. So... Take it small if you have a lot of things that need to get done. That way you're not stressing everybody and you're creating a more positive environment and getting that buy-in from everyone. So a typical plan could look something like this. Phase one, the important things, all income and expenses are recorded within five days of month end. Five days is a target. Your target may be a little different, but... This makes sure that all of your revenue, all of your expenses, your customer payments, your vendor payments, all of those things are recorded. Those are your pre-closed task items. They're recorded within five days of month end. That way, the month end close task can move forward, which is to reconcile all of those accounts. Your bank cards, your credit cards, your loan accounts reconciled within 10 days. If you can get that done, that's huge. That's 10 days into the month. You already have all of that data done and you're sure that those numbers are good because somebody's looked at it, they've reconciled it, they've signed off on it. Their task is done. That is a huge win for the business. If you can just get that done, that's amazing. And if you have a simple business structure, so you don't have a lot of employees, you don't have multiple layers of management, you're not tracking inventory, you're not doing shipments, 
like you're just a consulting business similar to mine or uh, a service-based business that doesn't have a lot of complexity to it, that could be 80 to 90% of what you need to do right out of the gate. Moving on to phase two, if you have accounts receivable and accounts payable, one or the other or both, this could be your next phase, things reconciled within 10 days of month end. So that's a close task. So reconciling your accounts receivable and accounts payable, what that entails is reviewing your accounts receivable detail report, making sure that all the payments have been posted correctly, that if there's any discounts or returns or things like that that need to get done, all of that has been processed and you are 100% sure on your customer balances. And then you know what? You could send statements out and say, okay, here's your updated balance. Let me know when a payment's coming. And then on the accounts payable side, you could go through and make sure that all your vendor balances are correct. And the easiest way to do that is to add a step into your process and notify your vendors that you would like a monthly statement. So if you have vendors that you regularly buy product from or provide services for you and they give you payment terms, then they can provide a statement that says, these are all your open invoices. These are the payments that have been applied so far and this is what you owe and when, and you can check that against your system as your reconciliation process to make sure it all matches. And if something looks weird, then you can work through the process of figuring out what went wrong. And it could be on your side or it could be on theirs. So phase three, an option here could be if you use sales orders and purchase orders, phase three could be reviewing open sales orders and purchase orders to make sure that the products have been fulfilled from a sales order perspective or the products have been received from a purchase order perspective and that the associated invoices and bills have also been received and entered into the system. I've seen a lot of times where a vendor is slow issuing bills. Freight vendors are notorious for this. They're slow issuing bills and so you might have a few thousand dollars in freight that you issued a PO for and the freights actually happen, but you don't have the bill, but you didn't review your open PO report. So you didn't know that you didn't get the bill. And then two months later, the bill shows up and then you're like, oh, I've got this $5,000 freight bill. I don't know where it came from. If you review your open purchase orders, then you would know sooner, hey, I need to contact this vendor and get a copy of this bill. And then you can make sure that you're getting the bills into your system faster and then paying your vendors on time. And then the flip side of that on the sales order side, if you fulfilled something and for whatever reason, an invoice never got issued, that's cash out of your pocket. And that's days taking away on their payment terms that they, they, they haven't paid you yet. So looking at those sales orders and making sure that invoices have actually been issued against them is very important for tightening up your cash flow. And then phase four, if you have inventory, you could implement cycle counts. Instead of saying, I'm going to count all of my inventory every month and we're going to reconcile it down to the penny on the last day of the month. If you have a small enough inventory, you could do that. But if your inventory is pretty big, that's really, really stressful. And in my experience, takes much longer than people anticipate it's going to and is very difficult to tie out for a month end close to get it done within a short period of time. So I recommend cycle counts because you can count parts of your inventory regularly throughout the year. And so you're slowly cycling through your entire inventory. So over time, your inventory balances. Now, if you have not reconciled your inventory in a year and you know that your inventory is an absolute mess out there, and if it is, you're not alone. Inventory is a complete pain in the butt. Do a physical count. Go ahead and do one. Suck it up. Take the pain. Do a physical count. And when you're doing that physical count, do not operate your business. So if you need to bring people in on a Saturday or a Sunday, do it. Stop fulfilling orders. Stop receiving orders. Close down that part of the business. Do a physical count for your inventory get all of your numbers verified, update your financial system, however that works for you, and then open back up for business. I know that sounds like a huge pain in the butt, but 
If you don't do that, you run the risk of inventory moving around while you're trying to count it. And you might miss it or you might double count it. And then you're going to find that error later and it could cost you some money. It's definitely going to cost you some time. So just take the hit, do the physical count, and then move forward with cycle counts if you believe that your inventory value or your balances are just completely way off base. That way you can get a good starting point and then move forward with that. So putting all these things into perspective, creating and implementing a month-end close process takes time. Hitting your initial close deadline and slowly reducing the time to close is an ongoing process. Don't be surprised or upset if you don't get it right the first time. You probably won't. And just like any other process, adjustments will need to be made as you and your team explore the process together and come up with new ideas to make it easier and faster. So my next question is, how are you feeling about this process? Do you think you can handle it on your own or do you need some help? Because if you need some help, reach out to me. Harrington Strategic Partners offers bookkeeping catch-up services, which will handle all of that data cleanup, the bank accounts, credit cards, loan balances, and all that mess. That falls under bookkeeping catch-up services. And then we also offer process development and implementation services. So we can help you define what your pre-closed and month-end close list should be. We can help you identify who needs to be doing those things. We can help you write the processes involved. We can make this as painless as possible, depending on how involved you want us to be. So you can get started faster and get further along your implementation track and get your month end close down pat. If you're interested in that, if you're interested in talking to me, I will leave a link in the show notes so you can schedule a call and then we can talk about what that process looks like and figure out if we want to move forward from there. If you've been listening to this and you're thinking to yourself, I have all of these other things I need help with. If you've been making notes during the podcast, as things have come up, go ahead and schedule that call and we can talk about those things on the call. Harrington offers controller services, CFO services, coaching and training for owners and teams. We do a lot of special project work. So bookkeeping catch up is a special project. Documentation and implementation is a special project. If you need help figuring out what went wrong and where with your inventory. We have a lot of experience with that. So you can reach out and let's just talk about what those needs are and whether we're a good fit to help you with those or not. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please share with your network and leave a review so our podcast can reach more women and have a greater impact. If you have any comments or additional topics you'd like discussed on the show, let me know. Before you go, connect with me on LinkedIn and let's keep the conversation going.